What's up, nerds? I'm Heroic Nerd, and this is a short documentary, much like all the other short documentaries that I've made about these old characters. For those who don't know, I'm over here making a series about Golden Age heroes, talking about their lives and singing the song of their adventures so that they can be remembered, because let's be 100% honest, nobody remembers these people except me and a bunch of other nerds on the internet. Because basically nobody cares about these characters except for me, and hopefully you guys, right? But none of that matters right now because today we have a really good one with a really good story, and his name happens to be Breeze Barton. So just a quick recap, Breeze Bartent at first glance is not very remarkable in the slightest. He is a soldier and he is a pilot. Mostly he fights with his fists or a pistol and uh, not necessarily in his first adventures but eventually he would grow into a capable leader and a strategist with the ability to lead an army into combat. In fact, uh, probably the most interesting aspect of Breeze Barton is his amazing rocket belt which allows him to fly as if in a jet, and even then he doesn't really use that that often. So the story of Breeze Barton takes place in Daring Mystery Comics uh, number 3, 4, and 5. It starts out with Breeze, who is an ace pilot fighting in the Second Great War. The story takes place in 1945, which is interesting because the Second Great War really wouldn't last through to the end of the year. Unfortunately for Breeze, things wouldn't end well. In the territory of South Africa, Breeze spots a battalion of Japanese soldiers heading into British territory. Breeze tries to go for help against the Japanese invasion, but his plane is shot down by kamikaze pilots. His plane crash lands in the desert, but this isn't just any desert, this happens to be the Sahara Desert, which is an endless wasteland which stretches for 3,000 miles. So Breeze gets to walking, even though he likely won't make it to the end before dying of starvation and dehydration. However, against all odds, Breeze stumbles upon a city. A wondrous, technologically advanced city whose inhabitants take in Breeze and heal him from his wounds. So I need to stop for a moment and ponder because something here doesn't quite make any sense. On the initial page, it said that Breeze was on an expedition into South Africa, but he was shot down by Japanese planes. First of all, the Japanese never invaded South Africa. In fact, they never fought in the African front during World War II, but you know, I'll give them that one for free because whatever, it's a comic book. But second, most of the fighting on the African front happened in Northern Africa around Egypt, Libya, and Algeria. And third, but most importantly, if Breeze was shot down in South Africa, then how the hell did he end up crashed in the Sahara, which is over 5,000 miles away? Can somebody please explain that to me? No, you, you can't. Nobody can. It's a comic. Anyway, as it turns out, Breeze has plenty of questions as to where exactly he is and how exactly he got there, and it turns out the answers are more interesting than you might think. It's here where Breeze meets the beautiful Anne Barclay, who offers to give him the answers he seeks. She takes him to the chief scientist known as Zenoba, who explains that the city Breeze finds himself in is known as the Great Miracle City, of Mirage. It turns out Breeze got here by passing through a specific fold in space and time known simply as the spot. When he crash landed his plane, he just happened to coincidentally fall through the spot and as a result Breeze is now stranded in the lands of Mirage. The only problem is that the people who enter Mirage are stuck outside of time and space. So they can never age, they can never die, but most importantly, they can never escape. So this is a fascinating idea, because as it's stated in the story, all the inhabitants of the lands of Mirage are effectively immortal. Time has stopped for them because they have been misplaced outside of our physical reality. Think of it like a pocket dimension, I guess. So there are people who have been here for centuries, and the spot which transports being into Mirage, has been around since the beginning of time. So just about anything you can imagine has passed through the spot at one point or another. So 
it all started with one guy, then like another, then another and another. And eventually you have all these people lost in time coming together to form a community inside of this anomaly. And that eventually involves into the great miracle city. It's such an imaginative idea which really elevates Breeze Barton above what other Golden Age heroes were doing at the time. I definitely appreciate it and I think you should too. And as we're about to see, this is absolutely true. Living beings from across millions of years of history inhabit Mirage. As we can see, Anne Barclay agrees to bring Breeze Barton to the spot to prove that he cannot go back home. So they go to the city gates where they find none other than a Neanderthal man guarding the lock, possibly millions of years old. He allows them to pass by, but Breeze remarks that the guard must be, in fact, millions of years old. But there's no time to worry about that because they reach the spot and it appears to be some kind of innocuous energy field that Breeze is convinced can't be passed through. Just then, a freaking dinosaur shows up to try and eat them, but luckily they are saved by that same piece of future technology known as a heatwave gun. So it's at this point in the story that we learned that the spot is made of something called reverse electrons, like it's some kind of electromagnetic field but in reverse. Uh, this is the reason why you can only pass through in one direction, uh, but just to be clear, uh, this is absolute insanity. It makes complete nonsense. It's 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 made up science. Essentially, what we're talking about here is a massive force with so much power that it has compressed time and space, uh, which is essentially like, I mean, its proportions are not unlike that of a black hole. This makes sense if the spot is a black hole because nobody really knows what happens if you pass through a black hole. For all we know, Mirage could very well be on the other side of a black hole. The only question remains is how a black hole exists in the Sahara Desert and why it hasn't consumed all of Earth by now. But one thing I know for sure is it is not a field of reverse electrons or whatever the fuck that means. You know what? This is a good topic of discussion. If you have opinions about what exactly the spot is, let me know in the comments. We should argue about this. I I'm sure some of you are fucking experts. Give me some knowledge. So now Breeze is convinced that the spot is some kind of electromagnetic field. And he has a theory that he may be able to escape if he uses magnetic forces on the spot. He returns to talk to Zenoba and explains his plan and Zenoba agrees to build a machine which would reverse the reversed electrons, essentially making them just regular ass electrons. But then a cloud of demon smoke shows up in the room, yes. I said a cloud of demon smoke. It circles around Breeze Barton's brain and steals the plans for his magnetic device. Of course, Breeze is confused by this, as am I, but Zenoba explains that the cloud came from the Demon City. As it turns out, Mirage is home to not only the Miracle City, but also another city as well. This city houses the demons from mythology, which have found themselves stranded as well inside of Mirage. And now, unfortunately, they have the plans they need to finally escape and invade the Earth world. Then, things get much worse the following morning when Chief Scientist Zenoba is kidnapped. There could be only one culprit for this heinous crime, so luckily Breeze is a competent strategist and he organizes an invasion of the Demon City. Then Muban, leader of the demons, mounts a counterattack, and there is a massive battle raging in the skies above Mirage. While this is happening, Breeze Barton lands himself inside the Demon City and infiltrates to learn that the demons are using evil sciences like mind control to cultivate their civilization. Meanwhile, in the demonic labs, Zenoba is having his mind ripped to pieces by Muban, the leader of the demons, who wants his scientific knowledge to escape Mirage. Luckily, Breeze Barton happens to be an expert fighter. He blasts his way into the demon lab and destroys all of their machinery. 
With Zenoba freed from his bondage, they decide it's time to escape. However, they are surrounded by demons, but just then Breeze gets a wonderful idea. He destroys the mind control machinery, which keeps the demons under control. Without the influence of mind control, all of the slaves run wild. There is a revolution in the demon city, with the slaves rising up and overtaking their masters. In the confusion of this battle, Breeze commandeers a ship and escapes with Zenoba. Finally, the battle is over and the demon city is laid to ruins. Then the comic ends with Zenoba and the lab finally completing the magnetic machine which allows Breeze to return home and Anne Barclay, who agrees to partner up with Breeze Barton so that they can return home together. But we don't quite get to see that yet. For that we have to wait for the next thrilling issue. But, I mean, relax, I'm not gonna make you wait. Even though this one nine page story packs like an entire novel's worth of content inside of it, we still have two whole stories left to get through before we're done. And this is what I love about Breeze Barton. His stories are of such high quality compared to other heroes at the time. I find myself engrossed in his adventures and inspired by his settings. And I hope you guys feel the same way because when I discovered this character, like I just knew I had to share him with you guys. Okay, here we go again. This time Breeze Barton has made it back to civilization, or so he thinks. Actually, he hasn't made it anywhere, because unfortunately, it seems his short time in the land of Mirage has amounted to 50 years in Earth's time, and Breeze finds himself locked in a futuristic battle between a group of civilized men and a group of vicious savages. Of course, Breeze hops into battle to help out the civilized men from being destroyed by the savages. With Breeze in the fight, the civilized men have no problem pushing back the savage invaders. At this point, one of the soldiers, a man named Frenchie, explains that Breeze has been missing for 50 years, and it's no longer 1945, but actually the year 1995. World War II was never finished, and both sides simply fought themselves until the world itself laid in ruins. Because of the endless conflict, humankind has resorted back to their savage primitive nature, and almost all technology has been lost. So this puts Breeze in kind of like a strange position because humanity has been degrading slowly over the past 50 years. Uh, but this has been just a few days for him, so technically, Breeze Barton, when he returns, is the only man left with the health and intelligence to lead humanity back to a civilized age. And that is pretty much exactly what happens. He instantly becomes the most important person on Earth, and he does the job willingly. Breeze immediately begins to organize the last of humanity. He teaches them to survive and even thrive using science and technology to their advantage. But the savages take notice of this and they aren't very happy about it. Uh, the savages actually have an overwhelming force because they outnumber the civilized people by more than a dozen. So they surround the fort and a battle begins. Even though the civilized men have advanced weapons, they are simply outnumbered and because the savages have no fear of death, they refuse to stop even into the last man. This gives Breeze an incredible idea. Instead of killing all the savages, he will instead challenge their chieftain to a duel, hopefully ending his reign. So then Breeze offers himself up to the savages for capture, and they take him to the chief for a duel. Of course, Breeze is a much stronger, much healthier, much better fighter, and he ultimately pounds the chieftain, as only a red-blooded American can. This causes the chieftain to go for a weapon which is dishonorable in their culture. He attempts to gore Breeze with the weapon, but he is stopped and loses the duel. He is shamed by the savages, who realize they have been following a coward this entire time. As it turns out, they actually aren't too bad, and Breeze offers them an olive branch of friendship and peace to completely end the violent war. 
With their conflict finally behind them, Breeze and the savages agree to work together to rebuild civilization. However, at the final moment, the evil chieftain returns to assassinate Breeze Barton. Luckily, Breeze is saved at the last minute by none other than Anne Barclay. They sure do make a great team, and it's at this point when they elope and become one. So at this point, it's safe to say that Breeze Barton is finally home, but it isn't quite home, not his home at least. He kind of realizes that there is no way of going home. There's just no way to go back to what he had. He just has to make do with what he has now, and he certainly does. Him and Anne Barclay team up together, and they make this kind of husband and wife duo, and they do everything that they can to organize a brand new society. But as we're about to see in the third and final chapter of this story, that new society is not free of its own problems. So there is no easy way to say this, uh, but in Breeze Barton's new world, there is a cult growing. A devious cult who at this very moment just happens to be planning a deadly demise for our hero. And he doesn't see it coming because he happens to be a really busy guy, literally returning society to its former glory. Fortunately for us, they send a couple of bumbling assassins to do the job and they are so completely incompetent that they are caught by Breeze and killed almost immediately. So this is where things get kind of complicated for Breeze Barton. He has all of his society up to code. Everything is organized and in its place. But there always seems to be something going wrong for the guy. First he had to deal with cosmic anomalies, then he had to deal with the demonic hordes, then he had to beat back the ugly uncivilized savages, and now he has to deal with nothing other than religious dogma. But this is no big deal for a hero like Breeze Barton, as we're about to see. The cult having failed to assassinate Breeze, decides that they are going to starve his civilization. Uh, apparently there are millions of members of this cult and they completely lay siege to Breeze and his men. Uh, they can't get any food or supplies from the outside world and this means that they are certainly doomed uh, unless Breeze can come up with a plan. So Breeze finds the leader of the cult and using a canister of rocket fuel, he just blows him to smithereens. Like he never even existed in the first place. Like a total boss, he just walks up and obliterates his enemy. And you know what? It actually works out. The entire cult just fucking surrenders and Breeze is victorious once again. So at this point in Breeze Barton's life, uh, he has completely revitalized Earth. He has organized humanity and rebuilt society, so him and Anne agree to leave society, the society that they built together, and go off and do some exploring. Since they have no more enemies, uh, there is nothing that can really harm them. But unfortunately, we never see another adventure from Breeze Barton, at least not in the Golden Age. Well, in fact, uh, I don't really count the Modern Age either. I will forever be eternally curious what kind of adventures he went on with Anne. Did they elope? Did they sleep together and make children? Where did they go? What did they do? What did they find? What did they explore? I'm dying to know, but this is unfortunately the last of Breeze Barton's tales, so I guess we'll never really find out. In fact, after this, the very next time we see Breeze Barton, he is making something of a guest appearance in the Marvel Zombies, and I don't really want to talk much about this because it's terrible. Basically, he shows up, and he's only in three pages, and I completely hate it. It's... Here, just... Okay, just take a look. Okay, look. Here, he's in this group photo, right? And then here he is shooting up some bad guys in the air with his rocket pack, which is like the coolest shit. And then here he is getting torn in half by a zombified submariner. Am I the only one here who hates Marvel zombies? I don't know. Like I would never I'm never going to cover that on this channel because I don't know. It's just it's so mean spirited, man. They should not do this to our beloved characters, especially Breeze Barton, man. That dude went through hell to save us. He deserved better than to be torn in half as if he was worthless trash. They make him look like a joke. 
Well, at least I was able to share his story with uh, you guys today. And that's why this series is so important to me because I see value in these old characters, even if nobody else does. And I'm happy that I get to share it with you guys. Remember Breeze Barton as the hero who sacrificed everything to save humanity and not the mere blood smeared joke that he is today. <sighs> but that's it for this comic. If you guys liked reading this comic with me and you want to read more comics with me, go ahead and like this video, subscribe to the channel, and donate to my website, heroicstudios.org, so I can make even bigger projects, more media, all kinds of cool stuff on the horizon. So get in on that now, heroicstudios.org. But until next time, nerds, Stay heroic.